family is known to leave the lights on for a long, long time just because we love the lights. So, you know, by Easter, we still have lights hanging around because we love the lights. So um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Judge all you want. Um, the other thing that we see are, uh, you know, a, a variety of nativities in our front yards. And uh, so there's the Holy Family with Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in, in the manger. And the shepherds are there and the animals are there. And uh, three wise men are already approaching, uh, although a little, you know, it's kind of preemptive. But anyway, so they're already there. And then there's Frosty leaning over, looking into the crib. Or, you know, there you have little baby Jesus in the manger and Mary just kind of tenderly holding Jesus, you know. And there is Rudolph and Dasher and Blitzen and Donner. Yes. So we invite a bunch of characters into our Christmas life, right, into our front yards. You know the one person you never will find on a front yard setting like that? John the Baptizer. <laughs> You know, he was kind of an odd character with uh, dressed in camel hair. Now, Luke doesn't tell us about this, but, you know, Matthew doesn't forget about it. He just makes sure that we know who John was and what he looked like. So, you know, he's a little bit on the wild side. Um, that's camel hair thing. I always kind of try to imagine what that looked like. And he had a big belt around him. And then uh, maybe this was the pre-Santa. No, just <laughs> wipe that out of your... Um, and then, uh, yeah, he ate locust and uh, wild honey. You know, it's just like, we like the kings, right? They bring, you know, frankincense, myrrh, gold. Well, now that I think about it, I would prefer honey over frankincense. But anyway, you know, the kings come dressed nicely. John, not so much. And so John is just not like the, the cuddly character that we imagine in that scene of the birth of Christ. But John speaks to the people in a way that I wouldn't dare to. Because, you know, he says, you brood of vipers! Well, that's, you know, imagine a bunch of people were lining up outside of Westminster, coming, trying to come in to be baptized, you know. And I can just see all of us like, yes, 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 this is awesome. Look what's happening. And, you know, and imagine Pastor Jeff and myself standing in there and saying, you brood of vipers. I think we would have some visitors the next day. And they won't be the wise man. They will be the district superintendent and the bishop and the chair of the committee of clergy excellence. And they will be, uh, you know, questioning our sanity and uh, whether we need to go home and discern our call a little bit. So that seems like an odd start to a sermon. This is what John is doing. He's preaching a sermon, and he's preaching to the crowd. This is, Luke is the only one who actually says that he's preaching to the crowd. In all the other Gospels, um, you know, John is described as preaching to the tax collectors or to, you know, special, the Pharisees, uh, a special group of people. But now in Luke we hear that John is preaching to everyone, and that's us. We're all part of this. So John starts with this, you know, uh, yelling insults at people. It's one way of starting a sermon. Um, but I thought about why he would do that. And I think what John, John is truly concerned, and he's passionate because he loves his fellow people. He wants them to be better. He wants them to walk the walk that God is asking us to walk. He wants community. He wants to, for us to love one another. So he's pretty insistent on this. And you know what happens when we can see our loved ones going in a direction where we know this ain't a good thing and they need to stop? We kind of get anxious and we get fearful and we get loud and we start yelling. There's a good example that might soon be happening in my house. So, uh, you know, as my daughters are, as Isabella even um, told me lately, uh, approaching driving age, 
you know, my anxiety levels are rising. Actually, not proportionally, but like this, exponentially. So, you know, I imagine us, like, you know, Julia and myself sitting in the car, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and um, I cleared that with her, by the way. So, you know, don't go over and console her. She's okay. Uh, <laughs> so imagine, you know, I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and she's driving, and, and I'm supposed to teach her. And she, I will say, uh, all right, Julia, so when the light turns yellow, we slow down. We slow down. Slow down. Julia, stop! <laughs> you know, we get anxious. We don't want our loved ones to get hurt. And I think that's exactly where John is. John does not want us to continue to walk that walk. And he gets people's attention. They're concerned. They're like, all right, all right. You know, you scared us. What shall we do? So the people literally ask, all right. What shall we do? And John says, those of you who have extra, share with those who don't. That seems like a, a, a simple concept, I would say. It does not say, and he does not say, and I want us all to hear that, uh, those of you who don't have come knocking on those doors that do have. That's not what John is saying. John is appealing to those who have to give to those who don't have. John, when he first yells at people and gets all upset, he's talking about people to repent. Do you know what that means? It's just a word that just goes around a lot these days. But repentance is actually a real simple thing. It goes like this. I'm walking this way, and now I'm repenting. I'm turning around. I could discontinue the walk that I've been on. I realize that was not good. This is no good. I need to turn around. I need to walk the right walk, the straight walk. I need to do that. And so, you know, it is kind of important that we get this. That's why, you know, John keeps going on this repentance thing. Um, and when they ask, what shall we do? And he says, share with those who don't have. That is the first step to a redeemed community because it takes two. It takes a receiver and a giver. That's a two-way street. Receiving, by the way, is really hard for some of us. Giving seems an easy thing, I think. Giving seems easy to me. It's really hard to receive. And I know, by the way, that it's been really hard for Jeff and Julie to constantly receive. They've been on the receiving end a lot. That should not discourage us to give. I just want you all to hear this, that that sometimes is not easy to receive. So just, you know, embrace that in our own lives as we do that. So next, John speaks to the tax collectors, or actually he's speaking to the toll collectors, because the taxes were collected by the Romans. The tolls were collected by those who prepaid for the right to do that. It's kind of an interesting way of going about it. So these are actually the people from the community. They have prepaid the, for the right to collect tolls in the toll houses and at the side of the street. And um, that kind of breeds corruption, wouldn't you think? That's very easy to walk the wrong path. That's very easy to ask for more than you're supposed to ask for in tolls. And that is exactly what John is asking them to do. That is exactly what John is asking them to do. Remember Zacchaeus, when he was... Um, in the tree, and Jesus met him, and uh, he promises, he was such a toll collector, and he promises that he would no longer do that, demand extra from the people that he shouldn't ask for. He says, I will give back everything that I asked for, actually, extra. So this is, you know, he, so the third group that John is talking to are the soldiers. Now, these are not Roman soldiers. These are mercenaries. These are people that um, 
receiving pay to do the dirty work, so to speak. And they actually might be the ones that are protecting the toll collectors. So there's a whole circle going on of bribery and all that stuff that we don't like to do, shouldn't do. And that's exactly where John comes in and says, don't do that anymore. Don't steal. Don't, no extortion. It is amazing, if you think about it, how John preaches like a revolution of new ethics. In the old days, when people were to repent, they would put on sackcloth, and they would put ashes on their head, and they were beating their chest. That was repentance. But John says something different. John says to love your neighbor. John says... You are the one who's acting to build community, to build relationships. This is what God is really asking us, to love one another, to love God, and love one another. There it is, to love God and to love one another. It's such a simple symbol, but I guarantee you, you will never unsee what I just made or showed you, to love God and to love one another. It's like the mission of Westminster. Love God and make friends and serve others. This is exactly what John is preaching right here. Well, in this last part of his sermon, John speaks about that he is not the Messiah. This could be an easy trap, right? Have you ever been in the position where you are mistaken for someone like, you know, Oh, you know, here's my gift for you. But it, wasn't, it was actually for, oh, right? So this is kind of a weird situation. But what does John do? John is humble. John reacts with humility. He models a way of life. He models the new ethics. He models how we should be. He could have easily said, yeah, bring it on and bring some gifts. <laughs> but he didn't. He answered with humility. He knew who the king is. He knew who to an how to answer and who to answer to. He knew. So I'm thinking about what is the conclusion of what John is telling us. I want to come back to this idea of Advent. I've been talking about this a lot, and many of you receive my daily emails with devotionals by you. Today, we got Bruce's devotional, which was beautiful. And every devotional I read, I realize these are all people, you, who are pouring out their hearts onto the paper, witnessing to how God is at work in all of our lives. And I read that, and I, I think they're all written for me. Do you feel that way? And I wake up in the morning, and I read them. Now, no, you know, since I was the one running around with a clipboard collecting and harassing all of you to write these devotionals, you also know that I have read all of them previously. But they are fresh to me. Every morning they come in, and I feel like they're written for me. They remind me, they set my day, they get me ready for this day of how am I going to be today? Am I going to be mediocre or am I going to be excellent in the life of Jesus, in the way of Jesus, in the ethics of God? Am I going to be like that or am I going to be eh? This is as much as I have to do, so that'll do. Or am I going to be like that? John is reminding all of us to be like that every day. And you all are reminding me, giving me this extra little, yes, I can do this. Yes, it gives me courage. It gives me the strength to do it and to be there. Am I going to fall short? Oh, you betcha. Houston traffic, you know, what can I say? biggest trap ever. <laughs> and the potholes and all that. Anyway, I'm not going to go there. Just not going to go there today. Advent is at the beginning of the church year. 
I think I said this before, but did you know that we have our own year? And, you know, kind of like the Chinese year that is different than our calendar year. So the church, ha we have our own year, and it started right back then when we lit that first candle, the short one. <laughs> I hope they're all going to make it. Um, it was right then when um, Advent started. And Advent seems so close. Advent, by the way, means coming. So naturally, because it's so close to Christmas, we think Advent is talking about the coming of a baby in Bethlehem. Yes. Kind of. The focus that Advent is about is the coming that Jesus promised us will happen. The coming again. And you know, John talks about this, and it sounds kind of scary. This coming again. This judgment and fire and all of that. That sounds kind of scary. But if you really think about it, we like to think about the baby in Bethlehem because we already know what happened when the baby came. We know what happened when the word became flesh, when God walked amongst us. We know that that brought peace and joy and just love. We know that. So why can't we take that lens and look at that coming with the peace and the love that comes knowing about what has already happened. Why would we think this would be scary over there? This was great. This is still God coming again. Why would God, who promised us over and over and over that I will love you forever, unconditionally. I will love you. I know who you are, and I will love you. I made you, and I will always love you. Why would that God be scary all of a sudden? The phrase, do not be afraid, shows up a lot in the Bible. That should be kind of a sign. It doesn't say, okay, scary angel. Ooh. No, the angel says, do not be afraid. Fear not. You know, as I remember. Well, yes, John kind of scares us. A little bit. And I think he does that out of love. I'll go back to that. But sometimes, you know, we live in a world that uh, uses fear a lot as motivation. And I think we're all a little tired of being pushed by fear. I speak for myself. I'm really tired of being afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear what's coming. Because, as I saw yesterday, the beautiful thing is that we shall all meet again. That is the story. We shall all meet again. That's what's over there. There's nothing to be scared about. This is the hope. This is what we know. This is what Jesus preaches. This is what John preaches. We will all be together again. So there's no reason to be scared. I will say, I talked about these devotionals, your devotionals before. But on Wednesday morning, I woke up and I read a devotional. And I thought, I could just read that devotional and not preach a sermon. But I know you'd be disappointed if I hadn't preached anything and just read but I will tell you, a little child shall lead the way. That too is scriptural. So listen to the words of Miles Kelly, who touched me. When people are making bad choices, the people that fear God and obey his commandments will be light over darkness. Wow, how can so much wisdom come out of a 10-year-old? Nine-year-old, not even double digits yet. Wow. Over time, the light can spread to other people. 
when Jesus Christ returns, the light will shine on everyone. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us pray. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You can sing with me, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, I'm going to let it shine, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Friends, you've heard the word, you have listened to the Holy Spirit who's been whispering in your ears. I can see it on your faces. You've seen and heard and you've experienced. And now is the time for us to respond. Responding to God can happen in so many ways. We respond joyfully to God with the things that we have been blessed with. Isn't it awesome that God has blessed us with so many things? Most of us had already had breakfast and coffee. Most of us have slept in a bed today. Most of us have been able to drive a vehicle here. Most of us are so blessed that we can be together in a warm space when it's cold outside. We are blessed. So now is the time to respond with our tithe and offering to joyfully acknowledge and give thanks to God for what we've been blessed with. At the same time, we pray to God. We speak to God together. We can do it one on one. And I'm hoping that uh, Tiffany and Jorge will pray with our friends in the back. They are. Uh, we can do that. Or, and or, if it's the time for you today, to join this church, to be a part of this community, to praise and worship God, to serve others, to love one another, to make friends, then please come and be with me and Pastor Sandra, and we would love to talk to you about what baptism is and what it means to join this community. We do all things as we stand as able and sing what we believe.